Good afternoon. My name is Kim Sayet, and I'm the director of the National Portrait Gallery, and it's such a welcome to have you here um, on such a joyous occasion. I would ask, though, if you could please uh, make sure that your cell phones are turned off. We don't want any beeping and helloing and, uh, in the middle of the audience. And also just to remind you that you are, well, you are, we are all being recorded. So uh, you'll see the cameras, and it's a lesson to myself not to launch myself in front of one of them. Um, so welcome. So what is a portrait? I spend a lot of time thinking about this. If it's a good one, like the one we're about to see by the artist Ross Rawson, it captures a moment in time. It's frozen, yet it's fleeting, like a snippet of memory that lived once and then is often replayed often. One of my favorite quotes is Picasso, who said, a good work of art is a lie that illustrates the truth. So on occasions like this, we tend to celebrate, which is very natural, the person in a portrait by thinking back in time. And today is absolutely no different. As we will soon hear, Dr. May Angelo has by, been by any measure one of the most extraordinary people with an extraordinary life. But today what I actually want to draw your attention to is the future. If we were in fact to think about the National Portrait Gallery as a great place to come and bring the kids, see fabulous artworks of famous men and women who've made an impact on this country as a sort of a form of national boosterism, I think we're doing ourselves a disservice. Of course we're about that, but we're so much more. We are in fact a playbook for individual achievement. The portrait that is coming to this country is a gift to the nation and it is going to outlive all of us. And it is going to serve as an example to future generations of what can be done if you just toe the line, think creatively, be part of your community and want to make a difference for the future. In fact, at the Portrait Gallery, we've been focusing on three things. The first are teachers. Teachers, as you know, um, have been struggling with teaching history for a very long, long time. In fact, history is the worst performing subject in the United States. And I would suggest that that now is beginning to show itself in lower registration at the polls, a sort of a loss of universal values across America. Um, and in fact, I think that the history has been taught really badly for a long, long time. There are a lot of people here who know the power of a story. And what we want to do at the Portrait Gallery is to help teachers recognize those individual stories that by every measure are exciting and wild and gripping. Stories are powerful, powerful things to learn lessons for the future. The second by association are teenagers, and I have two of them myself. And I'd like to think that my teenagers, who are now having to decide what kind of adults they're going to be, are going to emulate someone like Hank Aaron, for example, who just celebrated his 80th birthday here, or certainly Dr. Maya Angelou, um, than others in our history. Um, we, again, can provide a wonderful um, moment, a roadmap for our teenagers on character development and choice. And the third is really, it's about access. We want to make sure that everybody who comes to the Portrait Gallery feels that their story is told here. And I'll talk a little bit about that at the end of this, uh, this afternoon. But indeed, you know, following the great seal, e pluribus unum, out of many, one, that is the symbol also of the National Portrait Gallery. And you are very much part of that story. Everyone here has had to make choices. I hope many of you have made good choices. We've all made bad ones. But collectively, we all try to strive to have a better life, a better community, a better country. And that is what our speaker today has, that my, our next speaker has done, and in certainly our honoree. So it's with great pleasure that I'm going to welcome to the podium my sister director, Dr. Janetta Cole, who is the director of the Museum of African History and Art at the Smithsonian. the top of this very special afternoon to each of you, dear family and friends of Dr. Maya Angelou. My sister director, 
Kim Sejia, and I wish to really, really thank you for being here. And we want to acknowledge just a few of the folk who are with us. The Honorable Constance B. Newman. Ah. You know so well, Constance B., that we could not have arranged this very celebratory afternoon without you. There are many members of the diplomatic corps who are here. Your excellencies all, thank you for joining us. Secretary Clough, the secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, is unable to be here. But with us to represent the secretary and to represent himself is Dr. Richard Curran. Richard, Richard is the undersecretary for history, art, and culture at the Smithsonian. Now, Kim and I would love to call the name of each and every one of our colleagues from the Smithsonian, but we dare not do so. It'll take too long. But I really want to recognize Assistant Secretary Claudine Brown. And we certainly want to represent our two brother directors who are here, Dr. Lonnie Bunch, the director of the New Museum of African American History and Culture. He'll be back. He's probably over there at the site checking it out. I also wish to acknowledge Kevin Gover, who is the director of the National Museum of the American Indian. <laughs> With us also are representatives of the Andrew J. Young Foundation and UST Global. These are the two wonderful organizations that are serving as our sponsors. <laughs> Many of Dr. Angelo's family by birth are with us. Her son, Guy Johnson. <laughs> Dr. Angelo refuses to use the term daughter-in-law. She refers to Stephanie Johnson as her daughter. Also with us, her grandsons and her great-grandchildren. With us are members of Dr. Angelo's family by choice. There are so many of you family members here, you know who you are. And I need to say that shortly, I will be able to acknowledge someone extremely special to Dr. Angela. In the meantime, may we please know that with us, the Honorable Alexis Herman. <laughs> Ms. Susan Taylor and Mr. Kefra Burns. <laughs> Carolyn Young and Sonia Young. <laughs> Miss Valerie Simpson. <laughs> and wishing each of us our own trip to Bountiful, Miss Cicely Tyson. <laughs> I am 
I'm going to acknowledge now the presence of Miss Gail King, dearest friend. Gail is here with her daughter, and oh, am I glad to see my bro. Hello, Stedman Graham. <laughs> And now, Kim, I invite you to come back to the stage. So it is now with um, great honor that we welcome Dr. Maya Angelou to the stage with, shall, I, shall we, what well, you mentioned. What should I mention? <laughs> I think everyone's worked it out. And of course, her wonderful friend and ours, I think we all feel that we've been in her living room, is, um, Miss Oprah Winfrey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodness gracious. Look at the yes. beautiful people. Yes, for Miss Winfrey. That's beautiful. Goodness. Please, Miss Oprah Winfrey. Yay. We're just going to unveil the portrait. Hi, everyone. Yes. Yes, baby. Well, I, I, I had to be here. Stedman had to be here. We, we, we love Maya Angelou, and I would have to say that in my entire life, I, I, I don't know of any living person or dead other than Jesus uh, who's had uh, more impact on my life. And so for us to be here to honor the woman who has really uh, brought poetry to our hearts and spoke to our soul's experiences and helped all of us appreciate life and love and laughter and each other and helped us all to see that we are more alike than we are different. I am just so happy that we are all here to celebrate Dr. Maya Angelou. Thank you, my Can you ask you to help me? Oh, hold it there. Yes. Thank you, Thank you my darling. So we shall go? Yeah, we shall go. I, I, I'm a part of the unveiling. Yes, ma'am. Why not? It's, it's a very big piece of cloth, so it's going to take three of us, most likely. Good, miss. We're going to go to the bottom. And we're going to ready. Okay. On ready. the count. One, yes. no, yeah. one, two, three. Yeah, right. one, two, three. All right. One, two, three. Wow. 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 Oh my land. And it's still with this next. This is the artist, Mr. Ross Rosson. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, Mr. Rosson. Bravo. Bravo. Bravo, my dear. Bravo. Oh my lord, look at that. And oops. And now we're the gonna ask necklace. Ambassador Young. Oh, you gave me all those years ago. Yeah. So um, it is um, enormous pleasure, of course, to invite um, another person. It's almost a bit like who's not a VIP in the room here at the moment? Who hasn't made an enormous impact on this country? Who hasn't had amazing things to say and, and contributed to this nation's future in a way that is remarkable? Um, and one of the people that um, I've got to know because we did, in fact, recently, as I mentioned, um, celebrate the 80th um, birthday of Mr. Hank Aaron and his portrait. And it, the portrait is actually hanging on the first floor just outside when you leave the auditorium, um, is Ambassador Andrew Young. Yay. And, yes. <laughs> and, in fact, his portrait is also in the National Portrait Gallery. If you have a moment, I do hope you don't run screaming from the building, that you actually stay and you look. We have a lot going on. But on the second floor, as you go um, through the Gallery of the Presidents, quite appropriately is a gallery called The Struggle for Justice. 
And um, there is Ambassador Andrew Young's portrait, also done by Mr. Ross Rawson. And so I feel like um, I'm so blessed to be able to meet these people and then actually keep coming back to them every time I'm in the gallery, which is exactly the experience that we hope all of you have and um, our children have and their children have. So um, I just want to quote something that um, Ambassador Young said. He said, freedom is a struggle and we do it together, not only together as black citizens, but black and white together. And I think this is what an, an amazing celebration is that we can now celebrate with our first black president and all of the achievements that, um, and, the, and the pioneers in this room and those who have come before us have allowed us to celebrate in such a way. And, and certainly with Dr. Uh, Ambassador Young, actually he's a doctor, I think about 50 times honorary. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, welcome to the podium is Thank Ambassador you. Young. Let me thank all of you and thank the Smithsonian uh, for uh, making all of this possible. But um, it probably really is possible largely because Maya Angelou is. She suffered a great tragedy as a child and didn't speak for almost a decade. And when she finally spoke, it was as though she spoke from her soul and it was though the voice of God of unforgiving, of unconditional love, of understanding, of sympathy, of reaching out to everybody, whatever they are, whoever they are, whatever their condition, and reminding them that they too were God's children. She came to me shortly after the death of Martin Luther King, and uh, next thing I know, I was in the Congress of the United States. <laughs> and so probably all of us owe a debt of gratitude to the soul force. That's what nonviolence is. It's the power of the human soul, the human spirit, to overcome all of the evils of life. Nobody's come any closer to doing it than Maya Angelou. Maya, we love you. God bless you, and thank you. Okay. And now we'll have the pleasure of a, a short conversation with Janetta Cole and Dr. Maya Angelou. Thank you. I just need to get a little closer, Dr. Maya. Thank you. And turn a little so I can properly greet you. I thank you very much, Dr. Cole. First, Dr. Mai, I want to thank you for trusting me because you have not seen a single question that I wish to pose. You have trusted that we could have a conversation. Yes, indeed. Yesterday, Dr. Maya, when I said to you, happy birthday, you said it was her birthday yesterday. You said at 86, one of the things that you had learned is patience. That's right. Which seems almost a little counterintuitive to me. As I grow <laughs> older, I'm sort of getting impatient. Yeah. Talk about that a little bit, would you? Yes, yes. Patience, you can only have patience if you have love. And I don't mean love romantically, nor sentimentally. I don't mean much. I mean that condition in the human spirit so profound that it allows us to develop courage and the courage to look into each other's face, mm. no matter what color, no matter what community, to look into that face and see one's own self. I also think that courage is, it may mean that that which causes the blood to continue to to run coarsely and curse coarsely in our veins. It may keep the stars in the firmament for all I know. I know that when you have love, you are patient with people who make mistakes. First with yourself. Mm -hmm. You have to have it for yourself or you can't have it for anyone else. So you forgive yourself. And then you ask God for forgiveness. 
Then you ask a person whose name you may have taken in vain, someone whose feelings you may have hurt. You ask them for forgiveness. But the first thing you have to do is convince yourself that you are forgivable. Mm. And so that takes patience. And so I think uh, by the time you're 86, maybe I could have done it better at 85, but I didn't. <laughs> I oh. think I'm better today than I was day before yesterday. <laughs> Dr. Maya, I know that April the 4th is a bittersweet day yeah. for you. While it is the day that you came into the world, yeah. it is also the day that our beloved Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. That's yeah, true. Would you just share with us some of your most yeah precious memories of working with Dr. King in the Civil Rights Movement. Yes, thank you. Uh, one of the things that's not known much, and Reverend Andrew Young can attest to that, Reverend Am Ambassador Brother uh, uh, Mayor, Mayor, <laughs> Mayor, <laughs> Mayor uh, could attest to that. Reverend King had a wonderful sense of humor, and nobody talks about his humor. Mm. And that's unfortunate, because it means that young people, like my great-grand here, or my great-grand there, if she's here some, my, my great-grands uh, may think that well, Re uh, Martin Luther King was so great he wasn't human. And so I can't, mm -hmm. uh, I can't approach that. I can't even dream to be that. Well, he was human. And he made the mistakes that human beings make. And he was able to forgive himself and everybody. Mm. And everybody in Selma, Oklahoma. I mean, in Selma, you could forgive. Goodness gracious. Go to prison how many times and forgive? My land. I've just written a piece about uh, uh, Nelson Mandela. Same thing. Great people do have that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they don't have to live to be 86 to have the mm -hmm. ability to forgive. But you have to have patience. And Reverend King had great patience. And he would tell a joke in the back of a car. <laughs> He'd be sitting in the back. And we'd be going to a fundraiser. And he would tell a joke and make the driver almost crash the car. <laughs> <laughs> because very few people expected him to be funny. But he was hilarious. He could be hilarious. Mm -hmm. And he was kind. That's another thing that happens when you have patience. You learn to be kind and compassionate. So Reverend King was compassionate. Mm -hmm. And he understood everybody. He understood the Spanish-speaking, the Latinos, the Native Americans. He understood the Israelis. He understood the, understood the Palestinians, South Africans, white and black. Mm -hmm. Amazing. He said, I know, it because the truth that, that I've learned is that people can only do what they know to do, not what you think they should know. Not you can say, oh, well, you went to such and such a school. You, you graduated with such and such honors, and you should know better. No, you can only do what you know to do, mm. not what you even think you know. When it comes automatically, then you know it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Reverend King did what he knew to do. He was compassionate. He was kind, really kind. Mm. Dr. Maya, at this point in your life, mm -hmm. how, how do you look at the movement for dignity and respect and freedom for all people? Well, I, I start at the White House, and I see uh, our president. America's president, mm. and realize that African Americans were, n were not numerous enough to have put him in. <laughs> so he was put in by white Americans and Spanish-speaking Americans and Native Americans as well. I know that. And uh, I know that Reverend, I mean, President o o uh, Obama and his wife and his children and even a grandmother is in the White House. Black grandmother in the White House. Yeah. 
<laughs> we have made tremendous gains, and we have to say so, so the young people will know this is true. We have made tremendous gains, not nearly as much as we want to, but tremendous gains. When you look around and look out and see uh, Alexis as a former Secretary of Labor, look at, look at, uh, at uh, Ingrid Saunders Jones as one of the powerful people in one of the biggest uh, big businesses. Look, at, look around, women, black women, black men, and say, and we must say, we've made tremendous uh, uh, gains. We haven't made nearly as enough as we must do, and we need more and more people involved in the civil rights movement. Civil rights, not just race rights, but civil rights for everybody. So. Dr. May, I just want to take a moment, if I may, to acknowledge one of the icons in the civil rights movement. Yes. Julian Bond is with us. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Oh, I'm glad. Thank you. I'm so proud of that Bond family. Lord, been doing it a long time. Yes, I'm proud. Thank you very much. It's an honor that you come. I want to acknowledge the presence of my son, one of the greatest men I've ever met, my son. The greatest thing that ever happened to me was to give birth to Guy Johnson and to have the privilege and the pleasure and the fear and, the cre and all of that of raising <laughs> a, black, a black boy in a white country. <laughs> yes, it's a great blessing to me. And I have the, my grandsons, two of them are here. It's amazing, and my two great-grands are here. I'm just pleased. I have friends. I see Levi uh, Watkins, first black man I know, person I know, nominated for a Nobel in, in, uh, in medicine because he's one of the designers of the defibrillator. Black man. I love it. I'm pleased. Look at us. Look at us and say, we have, and Susan Taylor is here somewhere, and Kefra Burns. Yes, I know that. Amazing. We've come a long way. I just think 50 years ago, would, that, would I be able to sit here? Mm. Just me, not alone with Dr. Janetta Cole. <laughs> And indeed, 50 years ago, would a white woman named Kim be introducing me? Look at it. Be real. <laughs> Amazing. Here we are, still here, and still, still mo moving on up. Look at it. We are courageous people. We are courageous. Just think. I'm told that in that... Uh, in that um, museum in Greensboro, there's a, a, a makeup of, the, of a slave ship. And you can go in there, if you like, and sit down or lie down where the slaves, in, the, in places exactly like the places the slaves lived in, for all the time it took to cross that middle passage and be sold again. Imagine it, it's somebody lying in each other's urine and feces and menstrual flow. Imagine it, and getting off that slave ship, standing on a slam on auction block, being bought again, mm -hmm. getting up before sunrise, going to bed after sunset. Imagine it and still walking down the street as if she has oil wells in her backyard. Oh! Hello. Woo! Hello! Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm. My, my great blessing would be if I, if I had that power, 
I would make everybody an African American. <laughs> At least for a week. <laughs> At least for a week. Know what it's like. Know what it's like. Know what it's like to get on a bus or any public conveyance and have people look at you as if you've just stolen the baby's milk. Like, look at you and turn the face away. Mm -hmm. And still, saying, I forgive you. I'm not starting any, I'm not starting any race riots. <laughs> I forgive you. Yes. And I forgive myself. Mm -hmm. My Lord. Mm -hmm. Huh? And that's it. My son says, do it, Mom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay. Dr. Yes, Maya, I know that recently you received the Norman Mailer Lifetime Achievement Award. Yes. And that award was presented to you by a dear, dear sister friend of yours, Miss Toni Morrison. That's true. When Toni Morrison made that presentation, she said, there's so much to say about you. There's so much that we love about you. She said, but I just want to lift up the fact that you, Maya Angelo, you make us love you. <laughs> and I want to add to that, that you insist that we love each other. That's it. That's it. That's it. Because if you don't, how can you love Job and not Mo? You, Joe, you, you love Flo, but not Joe. Wait a minute. Something is wrong. Did you? Flo never made any mistakes? Really? Do you mean to say you can only love somebody who made no mistakes? Mm. Now, the person you may be angry with made some mistakes. But so did Flo, who you're not angry with. At some point, you have to be real. Let the brain go to work. Let it meet the heart. Mm. Let the two of them work together. You'd be surprised at how you will be able to forgive. Yes, please. And then you can look in your brother's face, in your sister's eyes, and say, yes, you're white. No, you're black. Yes, you're green. No, you're Spanish-speaking. No, you're Jew. No, you're Muslim. You're an Arab. No, no. I forgive you because I forgive myself first mm -hmm. for, for keeping you locked up in my heart. A, keeping you imprisoned in my ignorance. Out of my ignorance, I'm keeping you imprisoned. My lands, come on, kid. <laughs> At some point, you have to stop and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is this fair? Is this who I want to be? Chinook, is this who I want to be? You see? No, I, I want to be the free one. And in order to be the free one, I have to free everybody. Don't I? How can I be free and, and be, keep you down? Mm -hmm. If I keep you down, I have to be down there with you. Keep my hand on your neck. Keep my hand over your mouth. Yes. No. Dr. Maya, yes, I know that you have said... Yes. that writing is hard. Yes. And yet, you've written over 60 best-selling books. Now, yes, well, actually, I've, I've written 33 books. And uh, half of them have been national bestsellers. It's a blessing. Uh, I know that Hawthorne said, easy reading is damn hard writing. Mm. And what I've tried to do is write so that the reader is 20 pages in a book of mine before he knows he's reading. Mm. That's what I try for. I try to make the human voice come off those pages so that a black man in Alabama and a white woman in Des Moines, Iowa and an Asian person in Hong Kong, and a Spanish-speaking person in uh, Madrid, and an Arab in Egypt, and a Jew in Israel, 
I want them to pick up that book and be reading it and saying that's the truth. It may not be the facts, but that's the truth. The facts can obscure the truth. You can tell so many facts that you can't get to the truth. Mm. The places where the people who, the times when, the reasons why, the methods, how blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but the truth is something else. The truth speaks hearts to heart. It's the truth. I admire so much about you, my seasoned sister friend. Yes, ma'am. But one of the things that I really am admiring these days is how techy you are. <laughs> I mean, anybody who has five million friends on Facebook, <laughs> five million. I'd well, love to hear how you got into this well, stuff. Now, I, I do this. I do take people's children, and especially daughters, because I have the greatest son in the world. Mm -hmm. But I take people's daughters sometimes. And uh, I don't take them and keep them. I mean, well, I keep them, but I don't let, I don't tell the real mother or the born mother that she can't see the child. <laughs> I don't do that. <laughs> but I do take them. And one of my daughters is Oprah Winfrey. Oprah came down and she was visiting me and came and had a, an iPad. And she was, oh, talking and texting and carrying on. And I said, <laughs> she did that for a couple of days. I said, what is that? She said, it's an iPad. She went away. And uh, my mail came. And my darling, one of my daughters, Lydia Stuckey, said, I think it's from your, one of your best friends and maybe your daughter. And we opened it, and it was an iPad. So I learned how to find out my uh, Facebook numbers, and I learned how to text, no, email <laughs> Oprah. <laughs> I can email Oprah. That's all I know how to do on that. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> so, so it's all right. I can, I'm okay with that. When I need more, I have Lydia, and I have my grandson, who is really a techie, one of my grandsons, and that is uh, Colin Johnson. Colin uh, knows all about that stuff, and he can fix me up. He can hook me up, he told me. <laughs> <laughs> he can hook me up. You know, Dr. Meyer, you are, you are really beloved by young people. Yes, I'm grateful. And... It, it's, it's one of the most um, encouraging and hopeful things that, that I experienced, to see how so many young'uns, as I affectionately and respectfully call young people, yeah. look to you. Yeah. Talk a little bit about how you see the okay. young generation today. Good. Thank and you what you would like them to know from yes, you. thank you. I think uh, young people trust me because I don't lie. Mm -hmm. What I might do is not tell you the truth. <laughs> that is to say, I might say I don't want to answer that. Mm -hmm. That's all. Mm -hmm. But I will not lie. So my grands know that. My children know that. I don't do that. It's a waste of time first. It's ugly, second. And thirdly, you're going to have to make up another lie to cover that lie. <laughs> so the best thing to do is just tell the truth. If you say anything, you don't have to tell everything you know. Watch mm -hmm. yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but you just have to say what I do say is the truth as far as I know it. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons. I think with my son, when he was about eight or nine, I told him there is a place inside you that no, play, no one has the right to enter. No mother, father, no wife, husband, mm. no sister, nobody has a... That is that place that must be kept pristine. That is that place that is so valuable. 
It may be where you go to meet God at your last minute mm -hmm. or your first minute there. I don't know. But remember to keep yourself someplace sweet, someplace that nobody has a right to come in and say, you should have, and point their finger at you and curse you out or even hit you. What? No. No. So mm -hmm. they know that. I believe that. So I don't, I don't embarrass young people. When I, I remember when my, the biggest grandson, when he was, he was in maybe the fifth grade or something, the teacher found out that I was Maya Angelou and asked me to come in and speak. And then to speak to his class, he was so embarrassed. <laughs> his grandma, oh God, was used. <laughs> nobody, you know, when you're young, nobody can embarrass you as much as an adult to whom you're related. <laughs> And he just was dying. <laughs> and so I started with, there's a hole in my bucket, Deliza, Deliza. That wonderful song that turns around on itself. And I got the children to do it with me. When it was over, my grandson was so relieved, he got on the floor and rolled. <laughs> <laughs> and he got up, he gave me a big hug because I didn't embarrass him. So that's one of the things I've learned about young people. Don't embarrass them. You can tell them anything. Just tell it the truth and tell it with a voice that doesn't blame them for not knowing. They didn't come here knowing everything. You had to teach them English. Imagine if they spoke Tosa, 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 Izulu. You know? Mm -hmm. So take your time with them. Mm -hmm. And I do. And so they like me for it. They trust me. Yes. And yes. I'm glad. A few months ago, I spoke to 10,000 people in Texas. And uh, we were told uh, that over half of them were under 20. It's a blessing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm feeling very, very grateful, Dr. Maya, not only for this privilege to have this conversation with you, but for your willingness to serve as the honorary chair of the campaign at the National Museum of African Art, where yeah, I work. Absolutely. And so as you give us a click and call the language closer. Yeah, all right Zulu, now, Colin, guy. Uh, <laughs> all right. Would you, would you just share with us a few of the ways in which you remain so connected to the continent of Africa, yes. to its arts yes. and its people? Yes. Um, years ago, I, was, I sang with Tito Puente. I was a singer with, with Puente. And um, one of the... There were two drummers. There was Mango Santa Maria, mm -hmm. the Congoist, greatest Congoist at that time, and Willie Bobo. Willie was a, a drummer. And uh, Willie's people were from Cuba. And he taught me a song. And the song is Baba Fururu Ere Reo O He taught me the whole song. And I started holding the song like this. With, he said, no, you can't snap your fingers and do that. That's a religious song. So I asked him, what does it mean? He said he didn't know. <laughs> but, but his mother, his mother uh, taught it to them, and to all her children. And they sang it. And he knew his mother used that in ritual. So I, I just learned it and mm -hmm. just put it in my brain. Years later, I was living in Egypt. And uh, my next door neighbor, was, uh, her husband was the first secretary of the Nigerian embassy. And she said to me, Sister, you speak so many languages, and you even speak Kosa. But, Sister, you don't speak any other African language. So I said, I know a song. I believe it's African, but I don't know what it is, and I don't know what it means. And I started singing it. Baba <laughs> fururu I looked at her when she was crying. 
this woman, I mean, uh, Mrs. Young was her name. Uh, she, was, she was married to the first secretary at the embassy and very elegant. She always wore jewelry. She lived next door to me. She'd come over to have tea with me and put all this stuff on. <laughs> I mean, she was really. <laughs> and uh, she was crying, so I stopped singing. She said, no, please, it's the same thing. So I sang the rest of the song as I knew it. She said, sister, it's old Yoruba. It's ancient Yoruba. And it says, Father, Father, they have taken me from your compound, and they treat me worse than they, you treat a dog in your compound. And I'm now a slave. Is your magic strong enough to cross all this water? Mm. They've, they've taken me across water wetter than tears. Uh, and so it, somebody kept it in, in Cuba and, and kept it. And so I began to think, well, if that has been kept, my grandmother sang a, a hymn, and it was, Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I'm on the more bread of heaven. Every Sunday, the preacher would say, and now we'll be privileged with a song from Sister Henderson. Every Sunday, my grandmother would say, me? <laughs> <laughs> and the I mean, it was so embarrassing. <laughs> I just think, Mama, get up and sing. Everybody knows you're going to sing. They know what you're going to sing. Mama, get up. And the children in the children's pew would just be sliding off the pew, say, your grandma doing it again. <laughs> but finally, she would stand up and hold that pew in front of her and sing. And the woman had this huge voice. And Lord, she could sing. At least once a month, somebody would get happy in the church and throw her whole purse at the preacher. <laughs> she just, now... When I sang that to a, a man I was going to marry, an African, he said, but that's African. The melody is African. I thought, mm hmm. Mm -hmm. So I married a, well, more than one. <laughs> African. African. And I learned to speak some languages. And I lived in Ghana for a while. And I was at... Uh, in South Africa when President Nelson Mandela was inaugurated. Mm. Amazing. Mm. Mm. Yeah. My Zulu is not good. But my son used to speak Fanti and Arabic. And Kosa. Mm -mm. Amazing. And I've been African for about three thousand years, four thousand five thousand years or more. <laughs> so why why should I stop now at eighty six? Mm. Mm. <laughs> Dr. Meyer, I could sit here all <laughs> afternoon, but I want to be respectful Thank you. of you and your time. Thank you. Is there any parting message well, you would like to give your family and friends? Yes. That's everything I've said is the truth, Kefra, as I understand it. If I've, if I've not told the truth, I need you to tell me. I want the truth. I, I don't, I'm not in love with the position. If I love anything, it's the study of truth and the preparation of truth and the giving of truth. So if you see I've some said something that you don't think I believe, I need you to tell me. You don't have to shout it out in front of a lot of people. You can call me aside and say, Sister, Ma, Grandma, excuse me, you said such and such a thing and I found that not to be true. I will listen to you. Mm. I will listen. And I think you have to need, you need to prepare to listen. My darlings, listen. Listen to each other. Listen to your own heart. And in that quietitude, you might even hear the voice of God. Mm. Listen, listen, mm. listen. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my darling. Thank you, my darling. Oh. Thank you, my darling. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wow, how do you top that? Um, what a blessing. What an amazing, amazing few minutes. Thank you so much, Janetta. In the spirit of telling the truth and um, coming together as a community, as a group of friends and family, as a country, there are some hard truths to be learnt when you come to the National Portrait Gallery, and I won't sugarcoat it. We have a lot of work to do. Um, only 17% of our collection actually features women. So today was very precious and important to us in that respect. Only 4% African Americans. 1.5% US Latinos and even less than 1% features people of Asian American and Native American heritage. And only one picture, presently the actor Christopher Reeve is shown with a visible disability. He's in his wheelchair. So I don't want to put a dampener on the day, but I do want to say that if we felt that what um, Dr. Angelo was telling us is important and that we believe that together we can make an impact on this country and pass it on to the next generations, and I should mention in other countries, we get an enormous number of people from overseas come here to see what is this amazing thing that is the American experiment that is such a juggernaut, that is such a place for freedom and opportunity. If you care about those things and you believe, as I do, that portraiture can truly change the world because it's about individual achievement, it's, it's highs, it's lows, but ultimately we all made it, make an impact. A very good friend of mine said to me, you know, you come into this world with nothing and you leave this world with nothing. So it's what you do in the middle that's going to count. So I'm asking you, <laughs> as the director of the National Portrait Gallery, to obviously celebrate today, but please don't stay a stranger because I need your help, we need your help, this country needs your help so that we can add more amazing portraits such as the one you see today and we can hear more amazing stories so that the history is truly taught in an exciting and engaging and compelling way. The books that Dr. Angelo writes is just like the stories that we put on our walls and the performances in our galleries and by the way you can actually see performances in our galleries right today. We have an exhibition of dance up right now as we do have an exhibition on the life of Martin Luther King, and we have a wonderful portrait um, of the four female justices of the Supreme Court. Um, so please don't stay a stranger. Thank you so much for your fellowship and your friendship, and, uh, and we hope that you all come back, and thank you for a wonderful, wonderful afternoon. <laughs>